it is a great pleasure to introduce Evelyn Lee. Evelyn Lee, FAIA, is the first ever senior experience designer at Slack Technologies, founder of the Practice of Architecture and co-host on the podcast Practice Disrupted, which if you haven't subscribed already, I encourage you to check it out. It is a wonderful podcast. Evelyn seamlessly integrates her business and architecture background with a qualitative and quantitative focus to build better experiences for organizations' employees, clients, and guests. She is widely published, wrote a monthly column for Contract Magazine for over three years, and is now a frequent contributor to Architect Magazine. Evelyn has received numerous industry awards, including 2016's 40 Under 40 Award for Building and Design Construction and the 2014 AIA National Young Architects Award. She served as the first ever female treasurer to the AIA National Board in 2020, 2021, and now, with great honor, Evelyn Lee. Thank you. So I was telling um, Mickey that the last time I was here was in 2008 when he was receiving his gold medal. And I, I think I need to try to come back a little bit more often. So thank you for having me. Um, this, I, like any good keynote, I have 87 slides to jam into under 60 minutes. And we are going to try to keep this moving along and leave time for questions at the end. Uh, so, so this is me. And here's the next 60 minutes. I'm going to go a little bit into a little bit more of the research and work that I do on a consistent basis so you understand where my views come from. Uh, talk to you about the landscape or the changing landscape of architecture and who other competitors may be entering the field um, and, and how they look from a startup perspective. Talk about how we can move beyond practice so that we can actually do more architecture, what it's like to build agility in firms, and share some case studies of firms that are really a little bit more future forward. They actually appeared on the podcast. And talk a little bit briefly about what are the future opportunities for architects going forward. Um, this is really a culmination of my work over the last two years. And there's a lot of text on some of the slides. You will have access to the entire presentation, but given time, I'm just going to keep flying through them. Um, and if you, hopefully, we'll have time for questions in the end. So first, research. So I, I am a licensed architect. I started with humble beginnings at Drury University, mostly because they allowed me to play soccer while I was doing architect, architecture. Um, went to SciArc, and then I went back to school to get my MBA. I started off at UCLA Anderson, but um, I met my husband there, so it wasn't a failed excursion. Um, <laughs> but then I ended up graduating from the Presidio Graduate School with my MBA and my MPA. So the, the MPA is a master's in public administration, and my emphasis was on growing organizational development. Uh, I write a lot, and in writing a lot, I research a ton about what's going on around us. I'm constantly reaching out to architects about what's affecting them, and most of the articles that I write are really focused on how do we evolve business operations so that we can have the headspace to think about what the next opportunities that, um, exist, rather than being so focused on getting through the projects, which we need to be, um, but allowing us to have greater headspace to think about what's next. And then I spent five years after my MBA as a strategy lead at a design firm called MK Think. And the strategy, it was a really great place to be as a young architect. And the strategy group was established specifically to find opportunities for architects on the front end and the back end of traditional practice. And where are there opportunities for us to continue or begin a new client engagements and stay involved well after our buildings have been finished? Um, the strategy group was, is, it was a, a great place to be because it was a firm of 40. I think when we think strategy groups, we think the big, the HOKs, the Perkins and Wills. But it was really, a, a, it was 40 at the, at the top. Um, we were as small as 12. And the strategy group allowed 
MK Think to take more risks. It also helped them survive the last recession because we were still being able to build clients who weren't building. And then, so, and then now, in addition to working at Slack, I run a consulting practice called the Practice of Architecture. I have members of a community that we have called the Practice of Architecture Lab here today. Adam is one of them, thank you. But we're really just a group of forward-thinking architects that are constantly talking about what's next on the horizon and how we can move things forward. Um, and then I co-host Practice Disrupted. Um, so we had our recent gold medal winners on there. We had Larry and Angie. Hi, Larry. Um, and then season five literally just released yesterday, so we have 20 more episodes, or I guess 19 after yesterday, um, coming up to get us to 100 episodes, and we have ni over 19,000 listeners globally. Uh, so this is, when I talk about my research and my point of view, all of all of my research that goes into the podcast, that goes into my writing, is a culmination of talking to small, medium, and large firm architects looking at business practices outside of architecture that we should be adopting, but also trying to figure out who else is coming in to potentially coming into our territory, who are our other competitors, and where we should be looking at going forward. Um, a lot of people ask me what I do at Slack. I am not on the real estate team. I actually work on a cross-functional team at the center of that green dot, or that purple dot, sorry, called employee experience. So I work cross-functionally with our HR team, with our business partner team, with our business technology team, which is our IT team, um, learning development, which supports our professional development, and I do work with our projects team. So how do we build a better employee experience to retain our staff longer? The average turnover time for an engineer in Silicon Valley is 1.75 years. So anything that we can do to encourage engineers to stay longer and help us develop our product, that's where I am focused on. So building a better employee experience. And a part of my work is also supporting the Future Forum. So the Future Forum is part of Slack, um, and they are doing a, they're a, a study and a consortium um, uh, backed by BCG as well, that look at how to attract and retain the best talent as we shift to this, as we go from a pre-pandemic to current pandemic world. And they have this amazing pulse survey, if you go to their website, futureforum.com, where every quarter they, um, they survey over 10,000 knowledge workers to find out what's how are people feeling? How is their sense of belonging in their jobs? How are they doing from a flexibility standpoint? Are they happy? So they are essentially on the forefront of research when it comes to attracting and retaining the best talent. And I'm often brought in to talk about the hybrid workplace and how, how that evolves. So I get to have opportunities to talk with, um, we have Nike coming in next week, I talk to T-Mobile, USAA, we have a whole bunch of companies coming to talk to us about how they work in the future. So a little bit about the changing landscape. So I'm from California, um, and Silicon Valley in particular. So. Here's an interesting statistic. The VC investments in private real estate technology companies outperform the global venture capital market. So we have a lot more VC funders coming into this space starting and supporting new startups. In the first half of 2022 alone, 13.1 billion was invested in real estate and technology companies across all of the sectors that we tend to work in. So the only thing that I don't really see in here is educational, um, but, um, and you can see kind of the breakdown by sector of where that money is going into. These are the top 27 venture players. So if you want to understand who is making major million dollar commitments to brand new startups in the AEC space, these are it. Um, and you can see that more companies, including Autodesk, Caterpillar, um, there's even general contractors who are building strategic venture funds to figure out what's next in the AEC industry, um, to, to build a product to get us there. Uh, 
and to, and to move things forward. So these are all of the top players, but there are many more. And the outcome of that is that more companies, including those that are VC, fund, VC funded, are within the AEC space. Um, and they're hiring people with architectural backgrounds. So this is just, it's, an, well, it's a very incomplete list, but more, com uh, more companies and more architects are switching back career paths than ever before. I would say that I'm a non-traditional practitioner, and I have gotten more calls in the last two years about leaving architecture and going into tech than I had previously. And the big takeaway from all of it, and there's alternative career paths on, on the right. Usually when people ask, what, what is an al alternative career path? It's a little bit more building adjacent, um, but I'm getting a lot more people looking at, again, computer programming and data analytics, building out the employee experience. So what this ultimately means is that we are no longer competing against ourselves for market share and talent. But there's opportunity in that too, so I don't want to end there. Um, here are some of the startups, just so you know what's in the this, this space. So Plant Prefab is actually an older startup. They're in Series B. Steve Glenn is a good friend. He um, built, um, he built, he was one of the first prefabricated house builders out there. He is known for hiring well-known architects to, um, to work with. Uh, Plant Prefab is actually working with Brooks Scarpa, is that correct? Um, right now. The interesting thing about um, Steve is that now they, um, in, in, early in January, they really upped the technology when it comes to plant prefab. So I'm going to see if I can get this to play. There's no sound necessarily. But they'll be um, launching their first fully automated prefabricated um, assembly in Southern California. And the other, and they are an, um, they, they are an Amazon-backed company. Forgot how long this video is. So we don't have to watch the entire thing. Um, but this is, this is kind of what's coming for the next in prefab. See if I can just go to the next thread. There's another, um, so what's interesting about Steve is that he is somebody that has worked very closely with the architecture community, and I think that's one of the strengths of Living Homes and now Plant Prefab. Um, Mighty Buildings are people that believe that they've seen inefficiencies in the system. They are all founders that come from outside the AEC industry. What they are best known for is con uh, 3D printing. Um, they were the, one of the first 3D, printings, uh, 3D printers of accessory dwelling units in California. They're based out of Oakland. So the picture on the bottom shows what their product was. They've since decided it's really hard to put this product on a um, to, to 3D print a whole house. I, I think they hit that landmark. They've since uh, changed their model and they're doing 3D printed panels now. So now they're going to two floors, they're going into multifamily housing. Um, and again, these are people that are hiring architects to work at their company, but they have no background in architecture that they've just saw an opportunity. Cottage, same thing. Um, so Cottage is really about, um, was, was, there was a young entrepreneur, he was an engineer at, a, at um, one of, one of the, the FANGs, and we'll talk about what they, those are, but one of the big tech companies. He tried to build, build an ADU for his aging parents, and he found the process really arduous, so he said, let's, let's change that. So this is still... Um, this is still stick construction, but they have a bevy of 1099 design contractors that they're hiring to help design, to support the design of these products. So when you think about the evolution of the architecture firm, it's actually going away from, or potentially going away from working in-house in your typical architecture firm to working for some of these VC-backed tech companies. And what does that mean? 
Um, Saltmine is founded by an architect. This is, do we have any people working in commercial interiors? One. Um, so, <laughs> comer um, so Shagufta, um, she actually does uh, retail too, and she's going into to the food industry as well. Um, but this is an architect that really is, um, uh, she is a, a Series A private funding. She, she's actually a bit of a unicorn. This is her fourth startup. She's raised over one billion in total for all of her companies. Um, she is a architectural um, entrepreneur that is doing different sensor systems. So essentially how our buildings are being utilized and she is looking to corner the post occupancy market that I think a lot of architects have always wanted to play a bigger role in. So we're going to she's going to tell building operators how their buildings are functioning like how how are they um, how, and and how are they being used? What are the behaviors of the people in there? Kanoa Supply, for anyone who also does commercial interiors, is founded by Federico Negro. So he came out of um, shop, and he actually uh, he he actually was the founder of Case which was a Revit company, a Revit support company for architects that was later acquired by WeWork. Um, and now he's going into Kanoa. So Kanoa is essentially a drag and drop furniture system for people who want to furnish their offices with AI built in, so you get all the correct clearances um, according to code. So they're looking to disrupt not only the interior design, designers, but, but they're going direct to manufacture. So as they grow, they'll begin to disrupt the distributor as well, and the distributor model. Uh, and then Get Concert. So Get Concert is interesting. They're self-funded by seven very large architecture firms. They are, um, and they are an organization that has, they that one of their founders, one of their co-founders is an architect, but they're looking at um, how blockchain can support data security in architecture. So as our buildings get larger, as our buildings get more complex, as it's harder to figure out who is responsible for what addition to the drawing, Get Concert is developing a blockchain or a ledger system that's based off of what Bitcoin is um, running on to, to essentially secure data security for us so we can claim the responsibility and ownership of the drawings that are rightfully ours um, going forward. Uh, Cove Tool, so some of these startups like Get Concept and also Cove Tool are actually meant to make lives easier for architects. So Cove Tool is um, so it was started by two engineers slash architects that actually used to work at Perkins and Will, and they used to do the sustainable energy modeling for Perkins and Will, and it would take them a very long time to just energy model one building. Um, it's a family-run organization, so Patrick and Daniel are actually brothers, and Sandeed is actually Patrick's wife. They got married over the course of this, but they are making um, energy modeling easier for architects. So this is now a tool that you guys can leverage to use to show your employees or your clients. Testfit.io is started by Clifton Harness and Ryan Grieg. This was a startup that was literally started while they were in school still. So he has a few internships working as a for a developer and for an architecture firm. We interviewed Clifton on the podcast and he literally said, there's an opportunity here for us to do test fits faster. So they really believe in, there is a necessity for humans, but nobody wants to draw out 20 different layouts of parking lots, right? So there's an ability to do things like that quicker and easier. So any type of test fit, for developers. The interesting thing is that their market and the, the individuals that have been more receptive to test fit is really on the developer side, and architects haven't been as quick to adopt the technology. So if the developers were previously partnering with architects to do some of that urban planning, they're trying to bring that all in-house now. 
And then I wanted to throw in a few entrepreneurial startups um, from what I would say our Generation Z and what our next generation of architects are really interested in. Um, so this is Mobile Makers. Maya Bird Murphy um, was a former marketing and business development coordinator. She graduated in 2012, I want to say, from her, with her master's. Um, but I think Generation Z, the next generation, they're really looking for firms like Mass Design, for firms like Brooks Scarpa that are interested in changing policy um, and being more engaged with the local community. So Maya launched Mobile Makers. They have a brick and mortar. They launched it out of a, a renovated food truck. They have a brick and mortar space in Chicago, and she just moved to Boston, so she's expanding to Boston, and they run these little design shreds and design critiques for essentially a K through 12 audience. And this is where this is where Generation Z kind of wants to operate within architecture. Another fascinating entrepreneur that left architecture within the last two years is Vivian Lin. So when New York had to repurpose their budget to support COVID initiatives, they got rid of their composting program. So Vivian very quickly turned that around and said, I, how can I change the system? How can I make a difference? So she delivers CSA boxes to people, and then she collects them at the end of the week and takes away the compost from the CSA. And they've, she's upgraded it to recycles. But literally after two weeks, of starting that, she left her job at Raphael Vinoli. Um, and this is what she is doing full time. So this is kind of where our talent wants to go. This is where our talent is headed. And this is also kind of the competition, but also new tools that we should be looking at to help support the work that we already do. So when I talk about moving beyond practice, and when people talk to me about traditional practice, I'm looking at how do we expand? How can we do more at front of the building and how can we do more than after the building? And I think I've, I've been in the AIA a very long time. I've, I've spent over 15 years of the AIA and I've heard a lot of conversations about all the things that we've given away to project managers, to construction managers, you know, and we stay in our box of being traditional practice. But there's lots of opportunity ahead of us if we just seek it out and shift our mindset. Ooh, that's case it. So, for instance, how many times have you heard? And I've been guilty of saying this too. Architects should be one of the first people our clients call to give insight on any problem, right? Not just a building problem. Any problem. We want to be the first ones they call. Thank you, Joyce, for that laugh. Um, we should be leading the design thinking movement. Architects need to be doing that. Good design is good for business. And yet, we rarely transform our own businesses. So how do we use design to transform our own businesses? We spend so much of our design energy into our projects because they're billable. And I realize this next section is about what we can do with our overhead time. Um, but we need to be focusing on designing our businesses going forward. So how many of you know the um, history behind good design is good for business? So the term was actually by Thomas John Watson, Jr. He was the CEO of IBM and the chairman from 1952 to 1971. He also decided over his tenure, he did a lot of things. He, 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 did, he created a lot of partnerships um, with Saarinen, with um, Ray and Charles Eames, one move that he did was to um, bring in Elliot Noyes, who was an architect, who was a well-known architect at the time, and he was a curator of the industrial product division of MoCA. And he brought in an architect to redesign IBM. Not only the look and feel of the products, but how that is bred through the company culture and how that changed is how they interacted with their clients. So, um, so while an architect is not attributed, I'll go back one, for good design is good for business, I like to think that Thomas John Watson, because he brought in Elliot Noyes, believed and that this um, 
It was because of an architect that this phrase was actually born. So when I talk to a lot of architects and I ask them, are you multidisciplinary? This is usually what I get. Yes, we do residential, we do education, we do hospitality, we do commercial, we do retail. I want to expand that a little bit, right? I would say that this is multi-sector. Is it necessarily multidisciplinary? Could we look at building operations? Can we look at furniture and installations? Mass design does a lot of installations. Can we look at what does development mean? What does design strategy mean? What can we be doing in terms of graphic and environmental design? How can we be supporting real estate strategy better? How can we be changing policy? Um, and maybe even go into product design. Is there something that we can continue to sell even when our clients aren't building? So this next portion is really about building ag agility and it focuses on um, making it easier for architects to respond to change or, or more specifically, how do we make it easier for architects to respond to change and consequentially seek new opportunities? And then, and, and these are areas that are, have been researched both at my work at Slack and through my writing, but it's really by changing the mindset on a lot of these things when it comes to culture, people and policies, how we manage our team and productivity, um, the security and support of our drawings as well as our tools. So I'm gonna try to go through this really fast. I'll do a time check too. Um, so culture, so just a reminder at culture, culture is the sole differentiator of your firm. So anyone can leave your firm at any time and try to repackage what they did at your firm somewhere else. But the culture of your firm, I think is really foundational to who your firm is. And what we tend to do and how culture is viewed, I don't know how many people said, oh, we lost so much culture during the pandemic. You know, all of the social hours were on Zoom. But culture doesn't just live in the social hours, right? Culture lives in kind of the in-between. It's how you communicate with one another. It's how you work together. It's how you communicate with your consultant partners. Um, so we tend to let our culture evolve organically. Uh, our mission, vision, and values only appear in my employee handbook or you know, on the website. I don't remember a, sic a single value of a single architecture firm, and I worked for three, um, that I participated in. Um, and then we make it all about events. But culture is really important. This is a study that you can go to. It's called Culture 500. It's a, a collaboration between MIT Sloan and Glassdoor that says that companies within the Fortune 500 that focused on culture saw better outcomes across the board when it comes from, from innovation to productivity and everything in between. Um, so what's the culture look like at Slack? So our, our our mission is to make work life more simple, pleasant, and productive. These core values are what I'm measured against um, when it comes to my yearly review. Um, and we talk about what does it mean to be empathetic, not only to our, each other, but to our clients. Um, courtesy, thriving, craftsmanship, playfulness, solidarity, this is like, it's, it's burned into my mind because it shows up everywhere. It even shows up in our release notes. And I don't know if you guys are aware of what release notes are. So here's an example. Um, Google Cloud release notes are on the right. Slack, this is, this is how we are trying to be empathetic, right? So um, I can't even read the daguerreotypes. De um, <laughs> but uh, so we discovered that an update to an app failed. People were still being notified that the update was a success. There's a time and place for fake it till you make it, but this is not one of them. So we created an update to fix that. And that's, all the way down to our communication is how we live our values. So again, culture is your sole differentiator. So what we should be really doing is creating a values-based culture, especially for Form Z, um, for Generation Z and, and the future of architects. And then realize that our culture changes, right? We had a very different culture when we were all lurking remote. And as we try to come together and bring our office culture back, like that, culture is going to continue to evolve over time and it's not necessarily set in stone. Every time you hire a new person, especially if you're a small firm, means that your culture might evolve and it's okay. And I'm gonna go through these slides really quickly. You'll have a copy, but there's different tactics on each of these on how to revisit your, um, 
revisit your culture. So people and policies, again, this is really about creating better people frameworks to attract and retain your employees for the longest time. Um, so what do we tend to do? We intend to inherit kind of, I, I've, I've borrowed employee resource books or handbooks from other firms to build out my own employee handbook, right? Like copy paste, I'm getting some nods. But you know, what does that say about the individuality and the uniqueness of your firm and, and the intentionality of how you're approaching the employee experience at your firm? Um, I've, I've been accused, I've said, you know, at this firm we throw people into the deep end, deep end and see how they swim. Right, but how does that talk to really developing intentionally the talent that we want to see at our firms? Um, so whopping 95%, this is what's happening during the great re resignation of workers are now considering changing jobs and 92% are even willing to switch industries to find the right posi position. So when I talk about be building better policies, I'm talking about what is your onboarding process? My onboarding process at a firm was I was lucky if I got my computer my first day. I was lucky if, if somebody, like, I was happy when the firm took me out to lunch together to do a get to know you lunch. Um, but then the next day I, I was kind of left to my own devices, right? Go talk to your project manager, you're on this project. Um, at Slack, we build out a curriculum not dissimilar from what a student would get, like a syllabus in school about their life at Slack for the first year and what should be expected of them, what should they be able to do at the 30, 60, 90 day mark and how to move forward. And if you take people on that journey, if you take the younger people on the journey with you, they will be more likely to stay with you in the long run than if you just throw them into the deep end, which I've been, I've done to a few people as well before. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you build out these systems, these people frameworks that properly develop your, your team, then um, you empower them to show up and be their best selves at every day. There should be, we shouldn't have to worry about how much time they're sending in, um, you know, butts and seats. We shouldn't be counting time on the clock because we've empowered them to do what they need to do then. Um, so here are some things, and I'm going to go through this really quickly. Uh, team management and productivity, how has that changed over the pandemic? Um, so business as usual, we tend to try to move forward as we always have. Um, I've heard, even in tech, even in Salesforce, I've heard a lot of managers saying, I can't, can't wait to get back to what it was before. And the truth is, there's no going back. Right? People will have seen flexibility. They want flexibility. I have some statistics in here from the Future Forum about the flexibility of things going forward. So how do we build out new team management and productivity systems? Um, the first actually requires starting with a digital headquarters. So if you're wanting to give your employees the flexibility to work um, remotely, are you guys all on the same platform? One of the biggest complaints I hear from middle managers, especially middle managers working with multiple principals, is like, oh, if I contact this one, he's really kind of old school and he just wants me to pick up the phone and call him. If I contact this guy, you know, he's trying out new things. He's on Teams, so I need to contact him versus Teams. This principal, they respond only if I text message. So now you have like three different places where you could be losing information because you, all not, you aren't all operating on the same system. So how do you capture and retain information um, at the same time? And they, um, so this, these type of slides, these statistics are taken from our Future Forum Pulse survey that says that people that have adopted technology um, in a meaningful way where everybody is in sync and operating together um, are scoring higher on practice productivity, there's a better sense of belonging at the firm, and there's an overall increase in satisfaction. One of the interesting things about um, culture uh, is, is in, in tech, we usually tie it to a sense of belonging. So I know this goes back to a little bit, but um, sense of belonging actually increased during COVID 
because people were going through similar spaces. People were getting invited into people's homes in a way that they had never been invited. The other interesting thing is that specifically for minorities, sense of belonging went way up when Zoom culture was introduced and, and people got used to that, mostly because they don't have to code switch anymore and they aren't experiencing the same, and this is true of women too, they aren't experiencing the same microaggressions and biases that they experience in the office environment. So the sense of belonging actually rose for people throughout the pandemic. And here's the biggest change. 80% of employees want flexibility of, not, of, of where they work, right? So, and I think a lot of firms are doing it, right? We're saying two days, three days in work, the rest of the time at home. Here's the kicker. 94% want flexibility around when they work. And that's independent of the physical location. So if I'm, I'm a mother of two, right? Some days, starting August 9th, when I have in charge of school drop off, it's gonna really get, be really hard to get, for my day to get started before 9 a.m. But I want the flexibility to go from nine to three, pick up the kids, and then start again at five. So how do we change the way we're working to adapt for a flexibility of when employees work? So here's things that we can do. Create a digital headquarters, and then act if you are always remote all the time. So that means every single note, every single conversation you're having, any water cooler chat that is relevant, um, or even build a water cooler in your digital headquarters. We have over, I don't know, over 200 social channels in Slack, anything from cooking to being a better parent. Build out those um, social channels too in your digital HQ. Um, so here are some tactics around that. Uh, finally, security and support. This is just really, you know, enabling people to move to the cloud and to access their work whenever they can where, and wherever they're from. And so what we typically do, um, and this is lesser, this is less true following the pandemic, is ha having everything on-prem, having people VPN in. Um, a lot of the stress that came from the move to remote was the slowness of everybody trying to VPN into the same system. So move everything to the cloud, um, spend money, spend the necessity money where you can to get this done, because um, it will ultimately overall increase your, um, your productivity in the long run. And then finally, tools. So I presented a lot of tools up at front, some of which are able to help architects. Um, but I, I worked at this one firm, and they did these gorgeous renderings. But I think we went, this was pre-Revit, right? So we went from AutoCAD to 3D Studio Max, and then we dumped it in InDesign or Illustrator, right, before we could finally get it into InDesign. So we're creating all of these workaround processes that now some of these programs have inherent to them, and we're paying for all of this infrastructure and ability to do all of these things that we're not utilizing. So make sure that we're constantly looking at what is being updated within the tool set that we have and evaluating the tools that we have. Um, and then technology innovators, this is, this is from uh, the Future Forum. So this is, this is a cross sector, so it isn't specific to architecture. But to, again, technology innovators are dramatically outpacing technology laggards across resources, ability to give their team focus and productivity. Um, and what I talk to you, a technical debt is, is something is something we're even working through at um, Salesforce and Slack, is like all that workaround that I just talked to, if you could use one or two programs to do that, imagine how much time is saved on productivity and how much time you're losing on technical debt. So how do we solve for technical debt? Um, it's really just understanding what your tools do and understanding what tools you need going into the future. Um, so future forward firms, so I wanted, to, and I've mentioned them several times already in Larry's Friend Center, so it's hard to miss. Um, I wanted to start 
with somebody um, local to you all, as well as local to me in the state of California. Um, so Future Forward, and I really love the work of Larry and Angie, not only because what they do from an architecture perspective, but the fact that they've had to change policy to make some of their buildings happen. Um, Katie talked to about the need for architects to be a little bit more political and be more involved. Um, so, so, so they are. Uh, they're also co-founders of the AND Museum and the Los Angeles Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, as well as livable places. So they're working closely with policymakers all the time, um, and they're bringing along the future of the profession. So Cho Thompson is a, a firm. There's 10 of them. They're bi-coastal. Uh, these are two incredible women that launched their firm. They left a, a bigger firm to launch their firm together, um, Christina and Ming. Um, and Christina was three months pregnant at the time, and Ming was four months pregnant at the time when they launched the firm at the start of the pandemic. Um, and then they moved across the country. But they, um, they've expanded their practice. There are only 10 people, but they are engaged in architecture, interiors. They do a lot of graphic and brand strategy. So I don't know if any of you saw the equity by design reports that were first po posted out um, when Rosa Shang was doing um, equity by design a few years ago, but they did all of the graphics for that. And they've been able to parlay that into doing environmental graphics. So the San Francisco Unified School District hired them to do all the environmental graphics for um, their cafeterias to talk about healthy eating. So they've kind of really parlayed what they've done into a lot of different areas, even though they're a young firm of um, 10 and they're still winning awards. And now they're bi-coastal. Ming has since moved to Connecticut and they're still functioning. Um, Rios is interesting. They describe themselves as transdisciplinary. So we've seen multidisciplinary. Now there's transdisciplinary. Um, they're doing things with exhibition design too. But what's interesting, and if you listen to their episode on the podcast, they encourage anyone who wants to kind of lead a studio to come and present to their leadership team an idea for a new studio. So they actually have a couple residential studios, but they all work a little bit differently. And it's like this mini entrepreneur accelerator all under the umbrella of one, one firm. And they support each other, and they're able to take risks. Um, and they do a lot of exhibit design, and they've gone into landscaping. And, and they have their own line of products. They actually um, have their own line of bistro mugs that they do, too. Stainer Architects is on the opposite end of Rios. Rios was maybe an 80-person firm. Stainer is a five-person firm. Um, but as it says, they operate roughly half of their projects. So they found this weird um, niche in food systems. So they even help local restaurants with their sourcing um, and their owner operators of both a local restaurant and a local wine bar, as well as um, the, upper, the upper picture is um, one of their communities that they're building out, uh, a community food hall that they're building out for a local campus. So they've found this interesting niche um, and they've expanded and, and you know, being an owner-operator has kind of helped them carry themselves through the hard times as well. And then um, for architects, I like to uh, sh showcase because um, Leah, they um, Leah joined Kate and Sarah through acquisition, but Leah originally started her firm as an entirely virtual practice and what I would consider a very hard um, vertical, which is multi sustainable, affordable, multifamily housing. She runs her, it's a woman owned, 100% woman owned firm, entirely virtual. There's 10 of them. And they had this amazing summer internship where they not only paid their intern this incredible living wage, they were able to train them remotely because they're entirely virtual. But they also gave them a $10,000 scholarship when they returned to school. Um, and their internship was focus on minority architects or uh, minorities who want to be architects. So these are the type of, these are firms that are pushing the limits on how they work and where they're practicing um, for next. 
So I'm inviting you all to embrace opportunity, you know, to, to change the way that we've thunk from you know, how we've always done it to really asking, is there a better way going forward? How we have always done it, we haven't even questioned why we've always done it that way um, and how effective was it the way we always did it. And then um, reflect, uh, Katie mentioned this a little bit at the end, but I think any energy that we spend considering everything that we've given away or protecting our profession from those trying to take more away is energy that we can spend finding new opportunities for us to, consider, to continue to grow and gain more market share. So how do we refocus where we're spending our energy? Um, and just remember that change is the only constant that design is our superpower. And that's it. <laughs>